Hi guys. Hope you've taken the trouble to look at the other sessions one through four. Now we get to sessions five, diabetes mellitus. Today we're going to take the time to discuss things like the types of diabetes, insulin and its discoveries, the administration, hypo and hyperglycemia and sliding scale insulin, which is ordered by the doctor. Now we commonly use the word insulin in the workplace and we know that I cannot think of a nurse who's not encountered a diabetic patient. Even at home, you may have a family member who has diabetes. Well, diabetes accounts for a tremendous amount of lost work days and very poor health. And sometimes this can be avoided. We have things like amputations as a result, eye problems. I've even seen gangrene where toes and fingers have been removed. It's not a pleasant sight. It's very uncomfortable for that patient. Of course, these are some of the complications of noncompliance. So to learn more, please go to DearNurses.com and read about diabetic care for nurses in the clinical setting. Insulin is what we use to control blood sugar, and back in 1921, Best and Banning were known to make very exciting discoveries about insulin. Insulin is generally ordered by the doctor, and usually what happens if we have a patient who's a diabetic, when that patient comes into the hospital, the doctor is the one who decides if he wants that patient's blood sugar closely monitored and what insulin dose should be ordered. And do not forget, insulin is never given in a regular syringe. There is a special syringe set aside for giving insulin. The normal blood glucose is 60 to 20. Let us talk a little bit about blood glucose. First of all, our body needs fuel, energy, and this fuel is usually comes usually comes in the form of a sugar called glucose. When we eat foods, I know we have a diet which may be carbohydrates and proteins and fats and just all kinds of different things, but it's converted into what is called energy, which is glucose. The work of insulin is to take that glucose and keep it within the right range so your body can function. Because if your blood sugar gets too high, you can wind up with problems like what you see above there called DKA, or if your blood sugar gets too low, you can wind up with another kind of problem too. So if you look over on the left, you will see that the pancreas is the organ which produces insulin. And actually in the pancreas, there's some special cells called the islets of Langerhans, which are responsible for doing so. Now, there typically there are two types of diabetes we're going to talk about today. There's type 1, and this usually occurs in childhood. It's usually referred to as being insulin dependent, and the reason for that is patients generally have to take insulin every day. Then we've got type 2 diabetes, which accounts for about 90% of diabetes and generally occurs in adult life. Now, there are many people who've maintained a fairly healthy lifestyle and then they retire and they slow down, they eat a lot, they don't move around, suddenly find themselves with type 2 diabetes. And the doctor usually tells them maybe just a change in lifestyle again, back to some exercise and eating less, finding something to do which is very productive, might just take care of the whole problem, keeping the blood sugar within range. Now, DKA is actually what is called diabetic ketoacidosis, and this can be one of the complications of diabetes resulting in an extremely high blood sugar. If you've ever seen a patient with DKA, they usually come in with a blood sugar of like 600, very lethargic. Their respirations are usually very rapid. Their face is extremely flushed. And then they've got that really distinct fruity odor of the breath. The breath smells really fruity. You cannot miss it. Usually these patients have to be maintained in the ICU. They're closely monitored. Their blood sugars are closely checked very, very frequently, and insulin is given sometimes, in this case, it's given IV instead of subcutaneously until the blood sugar returns to normal. And typically, insulin is given subcutaneously, meaning it's given into the fatty tissue. But in cases, very special cases, insulin can be given IV. Of course, this is all done by the doctor. He decides. Now, take the case of this patient in the upper left-hand corner. He's saying, honey, I need you to bring me some more extra snacks. I'm tired of being starved. We do have that number of diabetic patients who are what we might call noncompliant. 
They don't want to hear that they've got to moderate their eating. They have snacks brought in, and sometimes you find with a diabetic patient, you ask yourself the question, I've given him insulin, I've done everything, why is his blood sugar still so high? Yes, there might be the case of a very brittle diabetic, but you might also have that patient who is not cooperating, having snacks brought into him. So you need to do some patient education. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little more about low blood sugar versus high, like we just discussed a moment ago. Sally, she has type 2 diabetes, and of course her doctor ordered 20 units of regular insulin every morning. That's in number one. Let's progress to number two. She was given her insulin. Then she decides to call the nurse. This is about a half an hour later. She was given insulin at 7.30. It's now 8 o'clock. No breakfast has shown up. She says, no, since you gave me that shot, I feel weak and shaky. Well, here's the problem. Regular insulin is, one, is a very rapid-acting insulin. It acts very, very quickly. And if you should administer uh, regular insulin to a patient, you should take the trouble to give that patient very specific instructions, like in number three. Nurse, this, this patient is telling, uh, this nurse is saying to her patient, um, that she's given insulin and if she feels shaky let her know if breakfast doesn't arrive she needs her to know and you can actually take a little juice about three or four ounces of orange juice or apple juice or some other kind of juice and sit it at the bedside instruct this patient if breakfast or that meal does not arrive in time take that juice drink it and call you because the time that's wasted Find, go calling dietitian to find out why that meal did not arrive. Maybe another half an hour would be wasted sending your patient into a comatose state because the blood sugar has dropped too low. So you don't want that to happen. You want to work to keep the blood sugar within normal range. So if you should give regular insulin, remember it's very fast acting. Within 30 minutes, it goes to work. Now let's give, talk a little about sliding scale. Sliding scale insulin is usually ordered by the doctor. And I want you to remember that insulin has its own special syringe. You never just take any syringe and draw insulin up because you're probably going to wind up overdosing that patient. It generally is a very slender syringe with a very tiny needle and it's specifically marked on the label insulin syringe. Now a sliding scale is done by the blood sugar is usually checked Whatever figure you come up with, you match it against the sliding scale. Let's say, for example, you came up with a blood sugar of 200. Then look at your range. You've got 200 to 250. The doctor's ordered three units. Let's say you came up with 300. Well, 300 to 351, he says eight units. But here, 400, he's given you for a limit. So what did he say if it's greater than 400? You give, let's say it was 450, for example, you'd give... 12 units and you call the doctor. Now, how about the other problem if the blood sugar was too low? 0 to 80, you don't give anything. You give some orange juice. Reason being, the blood sugar is low. You need to bring it up a little bit because if you don't, what's going to happen to that person when they start getting rid of all their energy and the blood sugar is very low, they're going to start feeling weak and shaky. So you give them some orange juice to raise that blood sugar. And how about 80 to 199? no insulins ordered. So follow the doctor's instructions and you'll be fine. Remember, this is only a sample. Please do not take this and say that you're going to use this as a guideline for the clinical setting. This is just an example of what it feels like using a sliding scale. So stay posted for more clinical issues. Hopefully in the next round, uh, session six, we would like to discuss diabetes and its complications and patient education. Have a great week.